Hi guys, I'm Carly. Welcome to Point Blank's Friday Forum Live. For those of you who are maybe tuning in for the first time or less familiar with us, we are an electronic music school. We've got courses here in London, a school in LA, Ibiza and online. Just head to our website, pointblankmusicschool.com, where you can find out more about our courses, which include DJing, uh, mixing, mastering, sound engineering, and radio. And until the end of the month, we've got 20% off all our online courses. Uh, today, we're joined by Anthony Chapman for a mastering class. He's a mixing and mastering engineer and a point blank instructor. <laughs> And just a reminder that we're streaming live. We love your questions. So if you do have any, uh, please post them in the comment section and we'll get to them in a bit. Hi, Anthony. Lovely to be here. Happy Friday. Yes, indeed. Cool. Yeah. So we're going to be doing, um, we're going to be chatting uh, through your mastering process. We're using yeah. um, a track called Hold On by Revelo. Revelo is a former Point Blank student um, and it, that track is actually the latest release on Point Blank Music. Yeah, I thought I, thought I would bring something yeah. that I've actually mastered for a release, Good so we shout. can use that as an example of the way that I tend to approach stuff like this. Cool, so should we just have a quick listen to maybe like the pre-master and then the kind of finish Exactly, so um, so I've got the pre-master here. It, don't freak out, I'm using Studio One to do my mastering. It's something that you've probably not seen on, on Friday Forum Live before. I know this is normally a Logic and Ableton's own, and I use those as well. Um, I, I use Studio One a lot. To be honest, the reason I started using it is because it's got a mastering environment in okay. it. So I prefer to work this way. Obviously, this is a single track, so theoretically I could do it in any DAW. But when I'm doing albums, there's a lot of features in this mastering environment which make it a lot easier to work in, in this, rather cool. than just doing it all in one DAW project and having to export it all out. Yeah, that but makes sense. I've got the pre-master here. Now, before I play it, just a couple of little things about the requirements that I know I've sent you and the guys here. Mm -hmm. uh, my sort of document of recommendations for, for uh, mix downs, how yeah. they should be submitted for mastering. And a lot of this stuff, I know a lot of the people watching this will be totally familiar with. The classic thing that people always say a lot is uh, 6 dB headroom or like a peak level about minus 6 dB. The thing you have to remember about that is it's not a magical figure that means it sounds really good. 6 dB headroom, if you say, if I say to you, do the mix down with 6 dB headroom, if you aim for that, mm. it probably means you're not going to clip. So long as there's some headroom, even if there was like, my, you know, 0 0.1 dB headroom, yeah. that would be fine. But if, if we say 6 dB, if that's something to aim for, it usually means it's going to be fairly certain you're not going to clip. Okay, cool. Um, so that's the main thing. Uh, and this track perfect, like the level and the mix down level, perfect. Well the done, Revelo. One tiny, tiny little thing. It wasn't a disaster in the case of this track, but it is something that um, we have to look out for, and that is there's no dead space at the start of the track. Ah, okay? okay. And I always say to people, when you do your mix down, you must, must, must leave at least a bar, maybe two. So th this is on that clear. checklist. Yeah. yeah. It's basically because lots of software, I, I know Ableton is sometimes quite prone to this, you can lose a couple of samples when the when the mix engine kicks in when you do a bounce. Mm -hmm. So that means, the no, I'm telling you, the number of times when I've mastered dance tracks and the first kick drum doesn't sound right. right. So that I get sent the bounce and it starts literally from bar one, beat one, and the kick drum kind of goes boom, da, da, da. So the first one is missing like a tiny, tiny little bit at the start. Right, okay. And if the rest of the track is fine, rather than bouncing it back and saying, can you please you know, move it all up, I will just take the second kick drum and copy it to the first one. Um, in the case of this, it's fine, okay? okay? But, it, it, you know, for those of you watching this who are doing mix downs, you want mastering, two bars sp space at the start is really, really useful, just so we can be sure we haven't lost anything. Okay, so cool. let's have a quick listen to the pre-master here. Um, we're just gonna go from sort of like this drop. Mm -hmm. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it up because Obviously, this being the pre-master, it's a lot quieter than the finished master, the finished sort of club-ready master. So other than the, the dead space, was, was there any other mix issues? No, this mix was totally out? fine. I mean, okay. the, the stuff that I tend to look out for is, uh, I tell people to make sure you haven't got like stereo widening on the bass, which is something that, a, a trap that a lot of people fall into, because that's gonna make my life very difficult. Right, okay. Generally speaking, mono frequency, uh, low frequency should be in mono. Mm -hmm. uh, for dance music, for club music, 
I tend to be quite brutal and I'm like 200 hertz. I want everything from 200 hertz down in mono because it's, it, you know, it's going to work much better that way. But I would rather most of that is sorted out in the mix down, you know. Um, and you've really got to watch out for, if you're sending your bass line into sort of widening effects and stuff like that, the low frequencies getting widened out is a big problem. When I'm mixing, I will tend to, if I've got, there's a synth bass sound which I want to sound wider, I'll kind of split it into two and I'll send the high frequencies to something to be widened but the bass, the low end, I'll make sure that's always in mono. Um, by the way, if anybody's seeing clips here, that's just literally because I've cranked the volume up of the pre-master, okay? That's not because I'm like clipping it in the mastering session at this stage. So, it's a great sounding track. It's very well mixed, it's really even. It's a really nice track. I was saying to you earlier, I, like, I quite like it's got a little bit of a garagey yeah, vibe in the bass line and the beats. Yeah, it's great, really, really good. So, um, this was a pleasure to master because it was it's all kind of sorted already. So oh, it's great. just a fun experience yeah. for me. Oh, how can I make this sound as good as possible? I'm not gonna lie, every mastering engineer will tell you the same. Sometimes you get jobs where it's like, how am I gonna save this? Yeah. You know, but, and, and, and sometimes- You get that, that can, a lot. We, with dance music, not so much. Okay. I do a fair bit of mastering of like, which is almost like restoration as well. It's like really old stuff. Sometimes it's tracks that only exist on vinyl anymore. So then people want to reissue it. So mm -hmm. they'll, they'll get as good a, re a recording from vinyl as they can get and then kind of send it to me to say, see what you can do with this. Yeah. So, you know, and it can be really satisfying, but stuff like this is actually enjoyable to like get it up on the monitors and get really vibed about it. So, if I put this um, volume here back to Unity. Now, what I want to sort of show you is some of the processes that I tend to go through. Now, this chain that I've got here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven processes in it. It's kind of like a typical sort of length of chain that I would go through mastering mm -hmm. a track like this. Um, sometimes I'd have a bit more. Sometimes you get these lucky tracks where it almost sounds perfect already. So I'll only use two or three different processes. Okay. Do a bit of EQ and then something to kind of like, you know, set the final loudness. In this case, I wanted to take it a little bit further because I really wanted to make sure I was getting everything out of it that I mm -hmm. could possibly get. Um, now, I know people watching this will be thinking, when's he going to get to talk, when is he gonna talk about loudness? We're going to get to that. It is really important, um, but I think it's... The importance of it is sometimes overstated. It can be a little controversial too. It can be very it? controversial, yeah. And, and, I, and I think, you know, there is no fixed answer about it, especially not with club music, you know. If we were talking about mastering rock or pop music, that would be different, you know. But for club music, it is reality is that Pandora's box has been opened. Like, we, you know, tracks are made very loud. Yeah. If you want it to sound right, played in a club, you've got to... I'm not saying you have to make it that loud, you have to make it sound comparable. Mm -hmm. um, but starting off, the very first thing that I did, I listened to the track and I just thought, I wanted some really, really crispy top end, like okay. real shiny, sparkly sort of stuff. And I've actually used a freebie plugin to do we this. We like free. Yes. Um, <laughs> I know that this has popped up in a lot of Friday Forum Lives. It's a bit of a point blank favorite. In fact, JC, who's here with us today, is the one who introduced me to this plugin, <laughs> and it is brilliant. It's great. This is this plugin called Lufticus. If you, if you Google it, L-U-F-T-I-K-U-S, if you Google it, you'll get the link on uh, KVR to get it. Mm -hmm. It's really good. It's essentially an, a, a sort of I don't want to say an emulation because I'm not sure it is an emulation, but it's, it's basically something that's trying to be similar to the Marg EQ4. Which And the famous thing about the Marg EQ4 is it has this air band, which is basically really fantastic top end, like if you mm -hmm. want to make something sparkle. So basically all I've done with this is I've set the high boost here to 20K and I've boosted it here just okay. to give it a little bit of... Um, Fairy dust. Just like, it's just <laughs> real, it's like in the hi-hats and stuff like that. It's really subtle, it's like, it's the very, very top. You know, a lot of the stuff I do in mastering, if the track sounds really good, I'm not doing super drastic stuff. Yeah. So sometimes people are a little bit disappointed because they think I, I, I might have this magical thing to completely transform the track. That's not what mastering is about. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really want to try and do subtle stuff wherever possible. So, Lufticus first. So this is an EQ first, a little bit of boost in the high end. Mm -hmm. Then we get to the big boys and this is, uh, an absolute favourite of mine. This is kind of one of the 
the, the finest plugins that there is, Bra uh, Brainworks BX Digital. This is version three, which I think mm -hmm. came out last year. I was using version two for years. Um, so this is an MS EQ. I've, I've, I've shown this in Friday Forum Lives before and I always get asked lots of questions about it because it is a bit of an unusual looking plugin. I know when I first saw it, I kind of scratched my head a little bit and couldn't quite get my head around it. Um, but basically, this is an EQ that allows me to deal with the mids, which is everything that's in mono, yeah. and then the sides, which is everything that's in stereo. Okay. So the left-hand side here is the mono section, and the right-hand side here is the stereo section. So if I solo the stereo section, if I turn it on first, obviously. So that's, that's the stereo stuff. So there's like hi-hats mm -hmm. and stuff like that all going on in there. And then the mono section, is the majority of the track, especially for a club track. The mono section is so, so important. Um, now, the reason I like this is because I can almost treat these two elements of the track completely differently. Mm -hmm. So the number one thing that I would do with, with BX Digital is, we've got this thing here, the mono maker, and you'll see I've set that to 200 hertz. So basically, everything at that frequency value and below yeah. is now in mono. Okay. So. That means I know that that really crucial uh, frequency range up to 200 hertz is mm -hmm. all in mono, meaning that, for example, um, if you think about a typical club, uh, clubs nowadays don't tend to be like one big room mm -hmm. where there's a sound system at one end. Like if you go to a concert, you know, it's generally a sound system at one end and it's facing everybody. In clubs, it tends to be there's a little room here and there's a bigger room here and another little room there. Oh, and in the bar, we need speakers there. Mm -hmm. A lot of these speakers are going to be in mono because there's no guaranteed way you can put stereo in yeah, that's right. and have everybody hear it. So it's really, really important and you just don't want to end up in a situation where the club system for one area folds the, the whole signal to mono and then lots of stuff changes or disappears. Mm -hmm. um, if you, That problem I was talking about before with, with low end, with widening, if it's too wide and it's out of phase, when they fold it to mono, it will just disappear. Mm -hmm. Like the low end will disappear. Yeah. Low end is always the first casualty of stuff like this, you know. Um, so I always do that for, for club music. For pop and rock music, it depends on the track, you know. Um, but I really, really always want to be careful to do that. Um, you'll notice as well, I'm using a high pass here up to about 30 hertz. I'm just trying to control some of the really, really low stuff in the track. But I've also, done a little bit of a boost here with the bass shift, about a one and a half dB. And what the bass shift does, and as well as the present shift, which is at the other end, it kind of boot, the bass shift boosts the low frequencies, but it then cuts in the low mids as well. So it's almost like, this is one of the things about EQ, is that you know if you're boosting stuff somewhere, you really ought to be cutting stuff somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know? It's, it's, you know, because obviously you get a level boost when you, bo when you boost it. So I really like, the way the bass shift and the present shift on this sound. So if I want a little bit more bass, that's the first thing I'll go to. Rather than actually turning up the bottom end, I will actually use the bass shift there. Okay. Um, if I just turn this up, you can see that when I turn it up, you see you get the dip in the, in the low end there. Okay, so. So. When this is on, it's just basically bringing everything into focus a little bit. The bottom end's a little bit rounder because it's all in the in the mono section. In the stereo section, I've high passed quite high to mm -hmm. take out a lot of those frequencies. Um, and then I've added on both of them a little bit more top end as well. I'm very conscious of that nowadays, like because it's 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 really important, not just when you're listening in a club system, I and mean, you want the top end to sound really nice. All the hi-hats and the tambourines and all stuff like that lives up there. You need that to keep the beat yeah. going. But remember, full small speakers, you know, phones, laptops, yeah. little Bluetooth speakers, they're really important as well. Because yeah. um, outside of a club, that's how most people are going to consume it. So you've got to make sure there's enough going on in the top end. Mm -hmm that it's gonna translate, the rhythm is gonna translate. It's very, very important. I also just think nowadays we're really lucky the way you know dance music sounds, the top end just sound, generally sounds really good. Mm -hmm. It's not like 20 years ago when we were, we were using fairly crappy analog desks and the top end tended, tended to sound a bit grungy and horrible. Nowadays it tends to sound really nice. So I really like to make the most of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's my 
that's pretty much all of my EQ that I'm doing on, the tr on this track. Okay. Um, because it didn't need desperately loads of EQ. It wasn't super unbalanced in terms of frequency. The next thing I'm doing is kind of a little bit more um, exotic. Uh, this is the FabFilter Pro MB mm -hmm. multiband, okay? Um, so this isn't just a multiband compressor. This can actually go both ways. It's, uh, you can use it for compression, but you can also use it to expand certain areas of the frequency. So I've used this to do a bit of both, okay? So if we go for where that drop is again. So we can see here, it's pushing back against a little bit of the bottom end. Now it might seem counterintuitive to boost the bottom end, bottom end a little bit with the EQ and then push back against it with the multiband. But actually what I'm after is smoothing it out a little bit. I still, overall it still sounds a bit bassier, but what I'm doing with this is those low frequencies, I'm, I'm reducing the changes in, in the level of it. Um, but what's really interesting is that I thought, I felt like there was something missing a little bit from the sort of the muscle of the snare. Okay. Um, like there's that snare and clap, and it sounds really good, but I kind of wanted it to bring it out a little bit further. So what I actually did was I used this band here. If I solo this band. You can hear there's a lot of clap and mm -hmm. snare, even in that, even in that really narrow band and I've set this to expand. So basically, it's just going the opposite way around to the compression. When the level reaches a certain point, it pushes it up even further. Okay. So the idea for me is that in these sections where the beat is pretty driving, I want the, the snare and the clap to kind of get, pop out a little bit, you know? And that I find that works really well, works really, really well. And then conversely, you'll see here, the next band is just pushing down a little bit on the, on the upper parts of the snare and clap. So again, as ever, you'll notice it's, it's not really doing much. We're talking about like, what, a maximum of about two and a half dB or any band at any, any one time. So it's fairly subtle, you know, but I really, really think stuff like this can help. So, so this is what we started with, this is the pre-master. And then that's with my EQ and my multiband. Okay. So it's a bit brighter, yeah. it's a little bit more focused. Focus is always the word that I think of when I'm mastering, especially dance music. I'm just trying to like, you know, you know when you, when it, the camera on your phone, when you touch the screen and it yeah. focuses in. That's the effect that, I, I want the audio equivalent of that effect. Okay. I want everything to be kind of sharp and you to understand what it is that the, the, the person who's made the track is mm -hmm. actually intending. Um, so, this, these first three processors, these are all dealing with um, EQ and also kind of spectral stuff. So the Pro MB, it's a dynamics processor, but it's, you know, it's kind of thinking about the different frequencies. At this point, it might seem a little unusual. I just felt like I wanted to do some compression across okay. the whole track. Um, again, nothing super drastic, and this is one of my favorite compressors for uh, for mastering or, or, or for the mix bus uh, in, a, in a mix down. It's the PSP old timer and it's just got a really nice, uh, I mean it's got va you know valve characteristics within the plug-in but it's just it's quite smooth. I don't really want a compressor that's going to react too quickly. I want something that I can, I, I feel like it, it, it can um, work in harmony with the music, you know? I don't want something that's really pushing down like violently on the peaks. Um, so if I turn this on, see, you can see I'm only doing like about one and a half dB compression. It just tightens it up ever so slightly, mm -hmm. ever so slightly. It's something that's gonna be, especially like the level we're hearing here, it's gonna be, it's gonna be difficult to hear the, hear the difference. If you crank it up a little bit, it is a little bit more noticeable. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for me, in mastering, I don't tend to do a lot of, you know, quite noticeable broadband compression unless the track really needs it. And generally with, with club music, it will be a, already be fairly tight, you know? It's, it, sometimes I'll get like quite sparse sort of pop or rock tracks that might need a little bit of help. But with, with club music generally, it's gonna be only ever gonna be a very slight amount. 
Sometimes I'll do it parallel. I'll like mix the dry signal and the wet signal. But with this, I've just put it across and just set the attack and release. So it's very gently just like tightening it up ever so slightly. Um, so that brings us on to, now this one, this is one I've really been looking forward to, to showing off, okay? So this is my kind of, um, I guess what I think of as my sort of, uh, well not secret weapon, it's just not something that was really thought of as being used mainly for mastering. Um, and this is the Black Box HG2. So this is a, a plug-in alliance uh, plug-in and it's an emulation of a, uh, a hardware unit, like a hardware valve distortion unit. And um, that might sound like the last thing you would want in, in your mastering chain. But actually, the hardware unit is often used in mastering and mixing, basically to add some harmonics. Because okay. there's one thing we think of, we say distortion and we think, oh, that sounds a little bit scary, that's a bit harsh. But anything that changes the shape of the wave of the audio is distortion. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the, the sort of side effects you get from distortion is you get harmonics generated or, or amplified. Yeah. And this is what I'm using this to do here. Basically, I'm putting the whole track through it, giving it a little bit of saturation, giving it a little bit of sort of valve action. I'm also adding a fair amount of air as well. You see again, it's that top end. Like again, I'm always paying attention to that. Um, so this is with it on. And what I really like about it is, it seems to saturate the, the kick drum ever so slightly. It gives the kick drum this teeny tiny little bit of distortion, which I actually really like. For this kind of track, which is a bit more funky, a bit, you know, I was saying that garage vibe, mm -hmm. when you bring kind of or little bits of organic flavor to it like this, I think it works quite well. If this was like a really cold, techno or you know trance or something I probably wouldn't use something quite so funky as okay. this I would keep it a little bit more clinical but for this it's got lots of movement to it you know I, I think it works really nicely um, so I mean this is you know this what we've looked at so far this is everything in my chain before we get to the the kind of final loudness okay. stuff okay now before we look at the, what I'm using to kind of set the final level of the track, I thought what I would do is just talk quickly about something that gets talked about a lot on the internet to do with um, mastering and levels, mm -hmm. and, and which is basically like, what level should we be aiming for? What levels should we be mastering at? And I mean, I'm as much as it frustrates my students sometimes, when I get asked questions like that, I usually say to people, does it sound any good? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a, I, I mean, I, I am challenging people a little with students. I am challenging students a little bit with that because I, I, I think it, the most important skill people can learn is to listen and to, to appreciate, does something sound good, you know? And I'm very much of the belief that, you know, the maxim, if it sounds good, it is good. But you need to know that it sounds good. That's the really important thing. Okay. And um, what this illustrates when we talk about l l luffs or luffs, this is loudness, loudness units full scale or luffs integrated, some people call it. Um, this is this different way of measuring the level and a lot of people present it as a sort of magic bullet which, which will solve all the problems. But in reality, it, it, you know, there is no one size fits all thing going on. So they're here. just kind of like guidelines. Yeah, well this is the whole, this is it, you've hit the nail on the head there. There are guidelines issued by different countries and different authorities. So we've got the EBU, the European Broadcast Union, they've got their R128 recommendations which says that broadcast audio, so TV and movies, should be a target level of minus 23 LUFs, okay? Um, but if you compare that to kind of typical CD mastering level, that would be like minus nine, which is a lot louder. Mm -hmm. Now, the AES, the Audio Engineering Society, um, recommends minus 20 for streaming content, so YouTube and stuff like that. But then the streaming services themselves use minus 16 for iTunes, minus 13 for YouTube, and minus 12 for Spotify. So they're massively louder than the AES recommendation. Now, what, when I see this, what I, what I take from it is just, just be sure that it sounds good. Just be sure that you're not completely destroying 
the integrity of the, the, the audio that you're, you're working with um, and be aware of there may be an, a necessity for you to do different versions of tracks. Mm. I mean, it's not the end of the world, you know. This is part of the advantage, I think, of the way I've worked on this track, which is make subtle changes, just do very small things. Because then if somebody came back, if you guys came back and said, oh, we want to just do a different version for Spotify, can you deliver it at minus 12 luffs? Yeah. I can do it, it's fine. I can just change my loudness settings at the end and give you that level, not a problem. Whereas if I was doing mastering where I was doing really extreme changes to everything, that would be much more difficult because any little change you make, everything else in the chain after it yeah. is going gonna, is gonna to change. So, um, so I think LUFS is really sort of, it's quite a useful thing in terms of reading the values of loudness differently. But I think we shouldn't get obsessed with it. You know, we shouldn't worry too much about it mm -hmm. and the reality is with club music we have to make it pretty loud you know we do i always try to ma to, to walk that tightrope between yeah. you know i i i, I uh, we were talking before weren't we about references and i don't tend to use references that much unless i'm mastering or mixing something that maybe i haven't done in a long time or i haven't okay. i'm not that familiar with so i'll kind of try and calibrate my ears but sometimes I'll go to Beatport and I'll download some tracks as, as WAVs mm -hmm. and then I'll listen to the masters and sometimes I, I just can't believe like, how loud yeah, they've been it's made. Because the thing is, they're, they're super loud, but they're also super squashed. Um, and, you know, you get ones where RMS values of like minus three, which is completely When bonkers. did that start happening, that kind of trend? I mean, I would say... Um, to it, I'd say late 90s with CD mastering is when everything started to get really loud. Um, uh, more and more, you know, pushed into the red line. Because, you know, it's, it's this whole thing of like, this is the shape of the, the mix down. If we want to make it louder, we literally have to just shave off yeah. all those peaks and just push it into it. Um, late 90s, I always think of like late 90s hip hop and R&B being where they really, really started to push it. And then everybody else started to follow suit. And there's some famous examples of, there's that, there was a Metallica album uh, about 10 years ago, I think, where there was almost like a fan's revolt because it sounded so terrible and people were like returning. Oh, really? I didn't know yeah. that. It was famously awful. And like the mastering <laughs> engineer didn't want his name on it because apparently they went to the mastering house with already limited mixes and they were like, make it louder. You like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, there's some really interesting stuff out there like to read about that record. It was a bit of a watershed moment. That's not to say everyone mended their ways, but I think it made a lot of people think about, okay. about the consequences of it. Um, and vinyl being a lot more popular now has changed everybody's kind of attitude to this. I do a lot of mastering where I'll do two different versions. I'll do a digital one and I'll do a vinyl version. And most, I'd say the biggest change for the vinyl version is I'm just not, not, pushing it into the peak limiting as much, anywhere right, near okay. as much. The, the, that whole thing of mono, of the bass mm -hmm. end of mono, that becomes even more important with vinyl. Um, but um, all this being said, with my metering, you can see over here, this is BX meter, the Brainworks yeah. meter, which is my kind of go-to meter. I really like it. It's very simple. It's got different weighting options because there's different standards you can use for um, the way it registers the loudness. I just tend to use the standard one. And the reason I like it is it tells us three really important things, okay? It shows us the peak level here. So at the moment, with, without my loudness processing on, in the drop here, we're getting about minus seven dB peak. We've just gone past that a little bit. It shows us the RMS level, which is like the averaged out loudness. RMS is usually a, a pretty good indicator of how loud something is overall. The way I always explain it to my students is um, if you had uh, a project in a DAW that was just a kick drum mm -hmm. on every beat, mm -hmm. and that kick drum was normalised to zero dB, like maximum, and then you bounce that out as a track, yeah. so it's like boom, 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 like that. I say to them, how loud is that? And the thing is, you could say, oh, well, it's, it's, it's full scale, it's zero dB, but it's only that level for like a split second, and everything else is much quieter. Okay. And RMS is how we average that out and come out with a, a figure for loudness over a certain period of time. So it's a little bit of a better indicator, but one really good thing about this BX meter is it gives us a dynamic range. 
as well. It gives us the dynamic range as well. So we can be sure that we're not completely squashing it. Mm -hmm. Obviously in, in club music, it's gonna get a little bit more squashed, but it's good to keep an eye on. Dynamic range obviously being the, the difference between the loudest parts and the quietest parts. And naturally, club music's rhythmic. To get the rhythm to come across, you need that, that, that dynamic range. Um, so, this is the way I approached the loudness on this track. The first thing I'd used was K-clip, okay? So this is actually a clipper, not a limiter. This is very, this is, you know, it's a different approach to, to a limiter. So what K-clip does is it literally adds gain mm -hmm. to deliberately push the, the audio into the limit, the, full, the digital full scale limit, effectively overloading it. But it gives you some control about how it overloads. Okay. So it's got this soften dial here, and I've got it on 20%. And basically what happens is, so normally if I just turn the fader up and the master clips on my DAW, the audio is just gonna go bang, straight into that, that, that maximum level. And everything above that is gonna be cut off. And if I push it hard enough, we're gonna audibly hear it distort. Yeah. What this, this soften control does, it's almost like uh, the, the knee on a compressor, which basically it almost puts the brakes on before the, the level hits the, hits the clipping point. Okay. So it kind of slows down and just smoothly goes into it. And that means you can get away with giving it a lot more level without hearing that distortion really okay. noticeably. Clipping is quite in vogue um, with mastering. A lot of engineers I know, um, I do it sometimes, uh, but a lot of engineers I know do like analog clipping. So they'll take the audio from their DAW, feed it back into the interface and deliberately overload it coming okay. in. Because some interfaces can handle that really well. So a lot of people I know will do that and then they will record that down and then they'll do their final loudness thing with something else, with a limiter or right, something okay. like that. Now with K-Clip, um, I've got this set to a ceiling of minus 0.5 dB. Uh, I know, I think the EBU recommend minus one, uh, as, uh, but they also recommend minus one true peak level, which is, which is prob it's probably not the place to go into this here, but it's, it's ever so slightly different. It's just a different way of measuring the peak level. I, I used to do it much higher. I used to go like minus 0.2 or minus 0.3. I've reluctantly pulled it down to minus 0.5 because there are artifacts you can get when stuff gets converted to MP3, which can push it beyond that. Okay. Um, but I don't want to go much lower than that because you are going if, if I went to like minus one, I feel like you would notice a difference between tracks being played in a club. Um, so if I turn this on, so you can hear straight away, mm -hmm. big jumping level. Big okay. Um, and you see here, it's telling me that the peak, let's go back here, I reset this. So it's saying a peak of about minus 8.9, minus 6.9, and I'm adding 9 dB of gain. So that means I've got about 2 dB uh, clipped. And we can see here, it's saying it's actually gone higher now in that last section where that little, that thing swells up. Minus, it's going 4.5 dB clipped. And we can see the difference in the waveform here. So, And I think, you know, it's a, it's a, for me, it's quite a predictable way of, of adding volume. I find sometimes with limiters, they behave very differently depending on what the, 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 the material is going through it. I find K-Clip is a bit more reliable. You just know what it's gonna do. It doesn't have any attack or release or anything like that. It's just a clipper. But that said, <laughs> the final thing I've done here is I've used Pro-L, the Fab Filter Limiter because I just felt it needed a tiny little bit more of a push and something a little bit more dynamic that's gonna move with the track. So, and I'm only like, it's only giving me about 1.3. So it's, a it's only a tiny little bit more. The other thing with the limit, li that little bit of limit at the end, I feel like it just locks it into place a little bit. And then if we look at our um, meters here, so what I've got at the moment is, about minus seven at its most RMS. And that for me is at the lower end of what I would 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 submit for a master to, for point black music. Okay. I'd possibly go a bit louder than that. But what I've done is I've actually done this deliberately to I've just pulled the limiting back at the end of it so we can just look at the 
the LUFS value here, okay? So you can see what we've got here. I'm getting this integrated LUFS value here of around about minus 10. This is Isotope Insight that I'm using for this. Um, and my target here is set to minus 16. A lot of people talk about minus 16 as being quite a good target for a lot of music. But with club music, it just needs to be louder, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I think if I push this ever so slightly more, just get the drop going. So we're now getting about 3 dB of limiting happening there. And then again, if we look at our luffs here. So this is getting us up to about that nine, minus nine luffs value. If you remember, I was saying about that old school CD level. This is more like what we're talking about. Um, I'm not gonna lie, there are some tracks that I've done for Point Blank Music where I've pushed it even further than that, but it 100% depends upon the music. The most of the loudness, there's so many mastering engineers I know will say exactly the same thing. In terms of how loud your track can go, 90% of that at least is gonna come from your mix. Yeah. So if your mix is good and it's balanced and it's dynamic enough, then it will, you know, you will be able to take it quite a long way. But, I'm, but the thing everyone has to remember is any particular track in terms of arrangement and in terms of mix, yeah. it's almost embedded within it is like, well, this is how loud this is gonna go. Right, okay. Because it's gonna sound right, you know. Different genres will work a bit differently. The one, the example I always use is drum and bass because drum and bass tends to be a lot less dynamic and have a lot less transients in it. So what you'll find a lot of time with drum and bass is you can really push it because the, if you look at the actual mix, the waveform will be fairly uniform. So you can push it quite a long way before you really notice it start to distort. But that's the, the whole thing with club music is if it's four to the floor music, it's got to have that beat. It's yeah. got to have that movement. So we can't push it too far. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think, I mean, if we, if we AB the whole chain, you know, I mean, it's a lot louder, mm -hmm. you know? So what I'll do is, I'll take off my loudness process in there. So yeah, for me, it's it, everything before the loudness processing is just about that focus. It's about bringing the whole track into focus. Um, and then the loudness processing for this is, I know this is a club track. Mm -hmm. I know I have to make this kind of club ready. So I'm gonna feel around with the K clip, see how much I can push it then see if I need a little bit more with, with Pro-L. And yeah, I mean, I, I think for me that, you know, I, I, I'm really happy with the way it ended up sounding. So are we. Yeah, well, that, well that's the most important <laughs> thing. And the artist as well, Yeah, right? he's happy so, too. So, yeah. Um, and I mean, uh, the one final, final thing is, if we look at the end here, So you see this track's kind of got a natural fade right at the end built into it. So this is something you've got to be really careful about. Um, obviously, the one thing I always say to people is, this is another thing for my recommendations for mix down for mastering. Don't do any fades or anything like that. Leave all that until mastering. Because if you, if you fade out your track, yeah. when I start working on it and doing the loudness processing, as your track fades out, yeah. the loudness processing will open up and what actually ends up happening is you, you kind of kill the fade oh, and then, yeah, it, then it all of a sudden that. will just go, it will just oh, kind of like okay. disappear. So I always say to people, don't do any fades, like oh. just leave everything as it is. Um, all I've done here is I've done a tiny, tiny little fade right at the end of like, I mean, what is this? This is 180, 165 or thereabouts milliseconds. So that's basically literally so it just doesn't click okay. at, the end of the, at the end of the track. Um, so yeah, so that's basically my so my process. How long did that process take you from start to finish? Mm, uh, this one, I would say, probably didn't take me a huge amount of time, maybe about an hour, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it can really vary. It can really, really vary. With mastering, I, I find, you know, um, sometimes tracks will come together a lot. The only reason this took an hour is because I tried a few things and I had a couple of alternatives and it just took me a couple of while to decide okay. what way I wanted to go. If there's a track that's a bit more problematic, I might spend an hour, an hour and a half, something like on one track. Um, but sometimes it could be longer, could be shorter. It totally depends on, on what it is that I'm doing. So. Cool. Well, I've got a question for you from um, Shane. 
He says he'd like to know if it matters which dithering al algorithm you should be used or <laughs> if it even matters. <laughs> right, okay. So this is, a, this is, a, this is something that um, gets talked about a fair bit. Um, dithering is effectively processing that we can add to our audio um, to probably the best way to explain it is back in the days of early digital recording of like uh, early CDs, when they were making classical CDs, what they were finding was in the really quiet passages, if you listened really closely on headphones, you could hear like distortion. And this is quantization errors. And basically it's like the converters of the time were not brilliant and it would get so quiet, the converter would be like, is there any audio there? I think there's some audio there. Oh no, maybe there isn't. Yes, there is. No, there and this it, it's basically the converter kind of turning on and off really quickly. Okay. So you get this like sort of distortion at a really low level. So what dithering will do, it will apply extremely low level noise all the time just to kind of fill that gap okay. at the bottom. So generally speaking with dithering, unless you really crank it, you're not really gonna be able to hear it. You might be able to meter it a little bit. You're not really gonna be able to hear it, but it will protect against these quantization errors. Now, my personal opinion, do we need to worry about that with, with club music? Not to the point where we should be, uh, it should be getting in the way of us doing stuff, you know? Um, most, uh, most limiters, will have, most mastering limiters will have dithering built in. There's also, most DAWs have dithering plugins built in. Mm -hmm. I just tend to go with whatever's there. With, with club music, if I was mastering, I mean, I've done some mastering in the last sort of year or so where I've mastered very quiet, um, delicate sort of music, and that's where I started to think a little bit about dithering again for okay. the first time in a long time and what I was using because it was actually to the point where certain bits of the track were going so quiet I start to think, oh, I might need to think about dithering this, and is it going to be okay? Am I going to be? Able to, is the listener going to be able to hear it? You know, um, but I would say um, it, it with Shane's question, it depends on what they're using. Um, I know with if you're using ozone. I mean, I'm <laughs> for a long time I was like that ozone guy uh, on on these Friday forum lives. Ozone has got a ton of options within it for different kinds of dithering, and I would say. Uh, Try some of that stuff out. I know in the mastering, the PB mastering course, there's some really good stuff about um, comparing different kinds of dithering. But you know, my personal take on it is try not to let it get in the way, or especially if you're making dance music, try not to let it get in the way of what you're actually doing. Um, uh, and just go, you know, something like the standard dithering within the ozone maximizer is gonna be totally fine. Cool, okay. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. Well, that's, um, uh, obviously, I just covered everything so perfectly and nobody needed to ask any you questions. You certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming in. My pleasure, yeah, my was, pleasure. Yeah, it was really good. Um, and if you guys out there would like to learn more about mastering, mixing, music production or sound engineering, head to our website, pointblankmusicschool.com, where you can find out more about our courses. See you soon. Have a lovely weekend.